What's going on? How many of y'all believe that you can have fun at church? Come on, make some noise if you believe that. That's why I love my church. We, we have fun here. I, I don't know about you, but I grew up in church. Some of you might have. And you could have that thought of, like, you can't really have fun in church. You can't have fun in church, right? Uh, but I love our church. We, we can have fun in church. Now, listen, there's definitely moments in church that are serious, that are holy moments, reverent moments, respectful moments. But at the same time, y'all, we're coming here every week to celebrate our God and to celebrate our designer, our maker, our creator, and the stuff he's done in our lives. So when you celebrate, there's going to be some joy. There's going to be some smiles. There is going to be some laughter, right? And so if you believe that, come on, make some noise crossover. If you like to have some fun in church like I do, right? Psalm chapter 126, the Israelites, they were celebrating because exiles came back to Jerusalem. And, and the Bible says this. It says, we were filled with laughter. We sang for what? Joy. And the other nations looked at us and said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. So even if you got some people that are watching you that might not even like you, they might be haters. Um, in this case, like they looked at the Israelites and they couldn't deny like, hey, God has done amazing things for these people. These people are blessed. These people are happy. They're full of joy. They're content. And if you look in culture today, most people are usually the opposite of that. You've got a lot of people that are sad, a lot of people that are down, a lot of people that are discouraged, a lot of people depressed and negative and hopeless. But if you're in the building today or you're watching this online, you have a relationship with Jesus, guess what, y'all? We got joy. We got hope. We got things to look forward to. And I realize, like, even if you're following Jesus, like, there's some days that are not great. There's some days you don't feel like you got joy, right? But I want to tell you today, sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Dude, you got to talk to you, you got to encourage yourself and be like, man, God has done some good things in my life. Amen. I'm going to celebrate the blessings. I'm going to be grateful because it could be a lot worse. Like, you woke up this morning, like, God allowed you to, to get here to church or, or to have internet to watch it. Like, there's a lot of people that don't even have those opportunities. So remind yourself of the good things that are going on. Like God is good and he's got good stuff for his kids. This past Wednesday night at, at First Wednesdays, Pastor Christopher shared Psalm 84, 11. And I just want to read it again because it's so good. It said, the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold what? No good thing from those who do what is right. So I want to encourage you. If you're doing right here today, keep doing it. Because good things are going to come. If you're not doing it right, you better, you can flip the script today. And some good things can come to you. Here's the other thing about joy and fun and laughter and happiness. Did you know it's good for you? Like it's good for your health. Like scientifically, it's, it's proven that when you laugh, when you have joy, it can actually add time to your life. When you're negative, like it can actually, and you have stress in your life, it could take away time. From your life, right? The Bible even tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 17, verse 22, it says, A cheerful disposition is good for your health. What kind of disposition? Cheerful, happy, full of joy, having fun, laughter, right? But, but look at the second part. It says, Gloom and doom will leave you what? Bone tired. Any of y'all ever been stressed out and it just sucked the life out of you? And you were tired and you were wiped out. I mean, the Bible's telling the truth right here. So look at the person next to you and just smile at them. Smile at them. And tell them laughter's good for you. You could giggle a little bit. I hear some of y'all giggling a little bit. Type that in the chat. Laughter's good for you. How many of y'all know somebody that laughs really funny? They got a funny laugh. And when they laugh, you just have to laugh just because they laugh funny, right? It can, laughter can be contagious sometimes, right? So... We're doing a series right now called Summer Fun at the Movies slash Binge Worthy, right? And we're looking at movies and TV shows, and we're pulling out themes and messages out of them and then tying that in with Scripture. Now, some people would say, well, why are you doing that? Why don't you just preach the Bible? Well, we are preaching the Bible. Uh, but you know what? If you look back when Jesus was doing his ministry here on the earth, he regularly told stories that were known as parables. Jesus was an incredible, engaging storyteller. He, he would gather thousands of people that would come and listen to his teaching. And many times he would share parables, paint a vivid picture, and then draw people in and then hit them with some truth. 
right? You know what? Today, in today's culture, movies and TV shows can be like modern parables. They can paint a picture. They can tell a story. They can draw you in. And so that's what we're using to illustrate scripture during this series this month. Um, last week, we kicked it off. Pastor Christopher shared about the throwbacks. And listen, some of y'all, I heard when he showed that Fresh Prince of Bel-Air clip about his dad, some of y'all was reaching for the tissue box, like, like oh my, right? right? How many of y'all remember that clip, man? That was like an emotional clip, right? TV shows can uh, evoke emotion. They can also cause us to really think about things. They could even maybe even bring spiritual change. How many of y'all know God can use anything to reach people? Even a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? It can make people think, right? So today we're going to be looking at a TV show that's actually a comedy. And it's kind of like in the same vein as that series called The Office. We got any fans of The Office here? Yeah, we got a few fans of The Office, right? So The Office is known as kind of like the genre of TV show as a mockumentary. So it's like a fake documentary that's full of humor and it's fun. And this TV show is actually based in my hometown. Where, where I grew up most of my, my years of childhood in Philly. And it's based at an underserved elementary school in the hood. And so I want to show you this first clip, and this is where um, some of the teachers were trying to approach the principal, um, trying to approach her for some resources. Let's see how it went. Check it out. <laughs> so that clip is humorous, right? It's funny. But at the same time, the sad part is there is so many schools in the urban community that are under-resourced. And when you have an under-resourced school like that, it affects kids and it can put them behind in life. That's real, y'all. Right here in this neighborhood around Crossover, there's some schools that are like that. Uh, we're partnering with an elementary school right over on 15th Street. We've done many things with Shaw elementary over the last number of years and recently they reached out to us again and asked us to, to get re-engaged in some new ways and Pastor Marty, our kids director, went over there. They invited him to come over and be part of a um, school assembly. Um, he didn't even know he was the school assembly. <laughs> so he went over there and if you don't know, we call him Magic Marty too because he knows how to do all kinds of tricks and illusions and stuff. And so he went over and did like a whole show and, and just all the kids loved it and so and we're finding what new ways that we can partner and help that school because if that school doesn't pull their grade up, they're an F school right now. They might not be around in the next couple of years. Hillsborough County is closing different schools that are continually failing. And so if we can help make a difference, like Crossover Church, we're about that, y'all. That's what we do, right? So if you're interested, yeah. If you're interested, you say, man, I got a passion to help kids um, see Pastor Marty. Like afterwards, it'll be by the, the checkout area and the kids, the kids area in the lobby. Um, connect with him. Uh, we're going to be relaunching our Sidewalk Kids Church, which we do in the park right next to the school on 15th Street. We'll be launching that in August, and where we kind of do like a whole like Sidewalk Kids Church. We take our trailer; it has a stage that we put down. And so, if you love kids, like like jump in, be a part. If you don't like kids, just pray. <laughs> so, you know what? I, I love people that try to make a difference in hard areas. That's really this TV show is a group of people that are in an underserved school 
and, and they're trying to make a difference there, right? Really, that's always been the heart of a crossover church. That's always been the heart of me and my wife, Lucy. Uh, when we finished college and we got our degrees, uh, we could have went to a lot of different places to get a job and, and be paid pretty decent, pretty well. But instead, God led us to come to Tampa, to come to this little church that had just started, that didn't have a youth ministry, and there wasn't many resources. There wasn't really a salary package or anything, but they're like, you just come, and we got this old van, and it works sometimes, and you can take that and pick kids up because we don't even have any kids, so you got to bring the kids here. So we were obedient to God, and we said, okay, let's go. And in 1996, we came, and the youth ministry was basically um, birthed out of mostly kids from the housing projects. Mostly kids that never went to church before, didn't have no church etiquette, didn't know how to act in church. Most of these kids didn't have a father. Most of these kids had a, a lot of different problems and issues. Uh, most of these kids are people that most other churches didn't want to deal with. But God called us like, this is where he wanted us to be. Um, the, the guy that was just rapping on stage a couple minutes ago before I came out, um, guess what? He was one of those teenagers 20 years ago. Yeah. And those seeds were planted in his heart. Recently, he connected back at Crossover. He's on fire for God now, using his music for God. And man, I, I had, you know, I connected with another guy for lunch this past week that just started coming back to church a couple of months ago. He, I used to pick him up in the van and the projects as well. I mean, I, I, I see my man, my man Anthony over there. I used to pick him up in the van. There, there's, there's several people that are still part of our church today because seeds were planted all those years ago. And now those people are thriving because they got God in their life. They're literally changing the trajectory of their family tree because they're doing it differently. They're breaking generational chains and generational cycles, right? Some of you that are here, that's your story now. You're changing everything because you're following God. And so as Crossover, you know, continued to grow with the youth ministry, soon I got pushed into being the pastor. We started reaching young families and young adults and all kinds of people that were coming. We came multi-generational. And we were at this little building behind Lowry Park Zoo, and we were running out of space. We started doing two services and then three services, and we had an overflow room outside on a patio. And it was great. It was amazing. But we're like, God, we need more space. And you know where God led us? To this spot right here. Anybody know what this used to be? Yeah. We talked about it last week. I want to be a Toys R Us kid, right? The throwbacks. So this used to be a Toys R Us store, but Toys R Us left, and they moved to the suburbs. Because in 2010, this was a really different area than what it is now. Um, this was the, the hood. It was known as Suitcase City. And Fowler Avenue uh, had a whole bunch of empty storefronts and empty restaurants. On top of that, we were in the middle of a recession, and the whole economy was really challenged. And so people thought that we were crazy to come here and invest millions of dollars into this old Toys R Us store in the middle of the hood and make it into a church. They thought we were crazy, but God. But God, we said, no, God wants us there to go and rebuild. Not just the building, but more importantly, to rebuild people's lives and rebuild families and rebuild hope. And that's what we have been about. And even though Abbott Elementary School, the theme that we're talking about today is a comedy, it has that underlying theme that a lot of the teachers that are involved there, they're there because they actually want to make a difference. And so there's a lot of stories in scripture about rebuilding examples where people go and they try to make a difference in a hard area. When God calls you to do stuff, sometimes it's way beyond your skill set, way beyond your capacity. And one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible is Nehemiah. Anybody ever read the book of Nehemiah? Nehemiah is an amazing rebuilding story. And so uh, Nehemiah, actually, their people were in captivity, and he was actually working in the palace. He had a good job. Most people were doing, they, they were on the struggle bus doing some of their jobs, but he had a good job. He was a cupbearer. So what that meant is um, he had to eat any of the food and drink any of the drink that the king was about to eat. So it was really good food, I'm sure. But he had to do that to make sure it wasn't poisoned. And then the king would eat it. So he was eating good, but his job was a little risky, right? But it was a good job. He was getting paid multiple six figures, living in the palace, killing it, right? Well, he finds out from some people that where all of his people have been taken from, they're in exile, they're, they're in Babylon, but in Jerusalem, where they were from, some people were allowed to go back, and he found out that it was just a hot mess. And so God broke his heart with compassion. And so he was praying 
and he was fasting and he was talking to God and he was like, God, what can I do about this? And then God spoke to him and said, I want you to go back and rebuild. I want you to leave your multiple six-figure job in the palace and I want you to go roll your sleeves up and I want you to lead this construction project and I want you to rebuild people as well. Now, he could have easily been like, man, I don't know nothing about construction, God. I'm just a cupbearer. I don't know nothing about leading people. But, but you know why he said yes? And you know why the king said yes to him? Because he spent time praying and fasting. And he was listening to God. Some of you right now, maybe you are in the middle of a rebuilding season. And you're like, God, I just need something to happen. I need something to happen. But God is saying, I need you to wait. I need you to wait on the Lord. We just sang that song a couple minutes ago, right? Anybody in a waiting season? You feel like you're in a waiting season? You're like, God, I'm just waiting for this breakthrough. I'm waiting for this miracle. But I want to tell you all something. Like, waiting is not this, y'all. It's not just this. There's stuff that we have to do during our waiting. I'm going to give you that in just a second. But we don't just sit there and wait. There's things that God has us to do during that time. And as Nehemiah was, was praying... And fasting, um, God gave him the moment to say, now go talk to the king. And man, that was a risky deal. Because if the king didn't like what he was saying, Nehemiah could have lost his job. Or maybe worst case scenario, he could have been killed. But because he was listening to his heavenly father, he was in that sweet spot, he was in the zone. The Holy Spirit told him, now's the time, present yourself to the king. Let him know the king gave him favor, miraculously. And even said, not only like, I'm going to let you go, but what do you need? I'll give you any supplies, any resources you need for this, right? So, man, he was blessed. So he goes. He's got a whole squad with him, an entourage. He's got all these resources. He shows up. Nobody knows why he's there in Jerusalem. He doesn't even make a big grand entrance or announcement because it wasn't about him. He was a good leader. He just went and kind of like just did some recon and surveyed what the situation was, looked at the walls, looked at the situation. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, this is what he said. He gathered all the leaders of the city, and he said, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been destroyed by fire. So let us what? Let us what? Come on, one more time for the people in the back. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. And guess what? Everybody agreed, and they jumped in, and the rebuilding started. But if you know the story, man, suddenly there was a bunch of opposition that popped up. There was a bunch of drama. There were some people trying to stop them. There were some people hating on them. And so I want to tell you, if you yourself are on a spiritual rebuilding journey right now, or you're trying to help other people spiritually rebuild around you, expect that there's going to be some pushback. Expect that there's going to be some opposition. Expect that there's going to be some drama. But that's just part of it, y'all. But I'm telling you, hold on. Don't tap out. Don't give up and be encouraged that God is with you to complete that rebuilding work. The Bible tells us that Nehemiah had a hammer in one hand and he had a sword in the other. So he was building and battling at the same time. Sometimes you got to battle and you got to build, right? If you're taking notes today, when you're waiting, for that rebuilding miracle, y'all, you can't just sit there, well, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. Like, you just can't just sit there and do nothing. You know what you got to do? You got to also work, and you got to worship. There's some work to be done while you're waiting. There's some things that God is building inside of you while you're waiting. You're working. He's working on you, and you can worship at the same time. Like, I'm still going to worship God. I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I've made some progress, and I'm going to worship, even though it's challenging and it's hard. Stay faithful. Stay consistent. You're going to see a miracle happen. Anybody had some rebuilding miracles in this house? Anybody? Anybody? We've got a witness in here, somebody that's like, man, God has done some things, right? Look at all the hands up. Get around some other people. Maybe, though, you don't have your miracle yet, or you haven't experienced one. There's some other people here that have some incredible, amazing stories, y'all. And the story of Nehemiah... Like he led the rebuilding to happen in just 52 days. And we celebrate that because, man, that seemed like a rather short period of time, right? And Abbott Elementary, like they had some quick wins of like they started a career day and it was successful. You know, one of the one of the Philadelphia Eagles like tapped in and it was was awesome. You know, they started a gifted program and, and that was great. 
But you know what? Rebuilding is so much more than just an event or a new program. It takes some time, y'all. Even though Nehemiah rebuilt the walls in just 52 days, and that's the part that's usually talked about and we celebrate that part, a lot of people miss the whole rest of the story. Because the rest of the story, which is the rest of the book of Nehemiah, which I definitely encourage you to go and read, um, it was a lot longer than 52 days. It took years to rebuild people spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Somebody say that part. Yeah, that part. It took some years, a lot more than just the 52 days that we can be like, woo, yeah. Now, Crossover Church, we came here in 2010, and we rebuilt this building physically. And we did that in a rather short period of time, a little bit over 52 days, less than three months. We rebuilt this entire 43,000-square-foot facility. It was an amazing miracle of God. But guess what? That was just the beginning. That was just the, just the, the first part. And there's been a lot of work that we've had to do over the years, a lot of struggle, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of things that have taken place to get us to be to the place that Crossover Church is at today. It's been 13 plus years that we've been here. But you know what? We've got, watch God move, y'all. We, we baptized almost 2,000 people in the past 13 years. We've watched so many miracles happen in people's lives. There's, there's so many stories. And then even as we look at this community that used to be known as Suitcase City, it's now known as Uptown. It's an innovation district now. Um, and there's all these resources and all these things that are, that are all this redevelopment that's happening here. Myself and Pastor Christopher had the opportunity uh, to sit on some boards to be part of helping guide and direct and give advice for some of those things. And so God has put Crossover Church in a place of, of leadership because we said, yes, we'll go and rebuild in that community right in the middle of that place because that, that's what you want, God. And so, man, we've made a lot of progress. There's still a lot more to go, y'all. There's a lot more. The story's still being written. Uh, but how many of y'all got a rebuild book when you first came to Crossover? How many of y'all got a rebuild book? Some of y'all got one. We ran out of those books several months ago, right? We put them in the gift bags for all the new people. But I, I got a rebuilding praise report, right? Some friends of Crossover Church paid for the printing of 3,000 copies of the rebuild book. Yeah. So I personally went and picked them up at their, at their, uh, their warehouse on Friday. And you should have seen my minivan. That, that joint was low riding. It was just me in there. We, I tried to, like, distribute it and put it. Because at first we put all the boxes in the back, and my car was like, it was like, I had the gangster lean on that thing. But, but we kind of distributed it. But the books are here. And so if you're here today for the first time, like, we're going to bless you with one of those books. Um, give it up for all the first-time guests in the house. We're glad you guys are here. The book documents the miracle story that we have. There's some music tied in with it. There's some videos tied in. But really, like, if you haven't read the book and you got a copy of it, like, it's a miracle that we're here. We shouldn't be here. Somebody say, but God. But that's what God does when you're obedient. You watch him do miracle things that, that, that comes in place. So I'm going to shift gears for a minute. How many of you guys uh, have ever worked in a toxic work environment? Raise your hands if you had to keep it up high. Look around the room. A lot of us, right? There's been some, some drama, some crazy stuff that we've been through. And it's hard to rebuild and focus on a mission when there's just a lot of toxic stuff going on, when there's a lot of drama that's happening around you in your environment with people fighting and talking about each other and gossip and rumors and all kinds of stuff. It's just, it could be stressful, right? I want you to check out this clip from the teachers at Abbott Elementary when they were arguing over who deserves the free tickets to the 76ers basketball game. Go Sixers. Check this out.
So that's funny, y'all. How many of y'all ever been in a, an environment like that where there's some crazy people going back and forth? And when that happens, you have a choice. You can do one of two things. You could pour water on that fire, or you could pour some gasoline on that fire. I know it might be fun to pour some gasoline on that fire sometimes, but I want to tell you this and remind you, family, that as believers in Jesus, we're called to be firefighters, not fire lighters. We're supposed to be the ones that are bringing peace. We're supposed to be peacemakers. We're supposed to shift the atmosphere in our work environments and what's going on. And listen, I know that a lot of us spend a lot of time working with other people and working for other people that don't have a relationship with Jesus. So sometimes they're doing the most. They act a little different, right? It can be super frustrating at times. Can I get an amen in the building? Amen. Right? How many of y'all have ever uh, been in a situation like that with a boss that just gets under your skin? I mean, it's challenging, right? But I want to remind you what scripture says and give you some biblical instruction that we get from the New Testament in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 22. And, and this is from the message translation. And I love the way that it pops out because um, it literally slaps you in the face. It says this, y'all. It says, servants, do what you're told by your earthly masters, aka your bosses. And don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your what? Best. Say it one more time. Best. Come on, one more time, real loud. Best. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master, for God. Be confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind when? Always. That the ultimate master that you're serving is who? It's Christ Jesus, right? The sullen servant um, who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Boom, mic drop. That, that's some bars right there, y'all. For real. For real. So, so I want to give you a couple application points before we... We, we end up today, and here's some stuff for us today. Number one, if you're taking notes today, do your best. Do your best. Do your best. Big D, do your best, man. We're rooting for you out there on the football field. Go Bulls, right? Do your best. Judy with an I, do your best everywhere you go. Judy with an I, she always says it like that. Do your best. Mark, do your best. Do your best, man. Your family is counting on you. Do your best in everything that you do. Dolfo, you got that degree now, man. Do your best. Do your best. Do everything that God has called you to do. Look at the person next to you. Tell them, do your best. Do your best. Type that in the chat. Here's why especially I think it's important since the pandemic to do your best. Because a lot of people have gotten lazy at their jobs. A lot of people have gotten apathetic. A lot of people don't want to work anymore. They got to stay at home for a little while. They got a little stimulus check. And, and now it's been challenging for people to get it. Get, well, here we are a couple years later and people are still like, oh man, work, right? There's a thing that's called quiet quitting. Anybody heard about that? It's like an epidemic in the work world. Like people can't afford to quit their job, but they kind of mentally and emotionally quit it. Quiet quitting. So they're still there, but they're really just like a warm body feeling a seat. And they're doing the bare, bare, bare minimum just to get by. They're not really engaged. They're not really helping. They really don't like their job at all. They're just showing up for the paycheck. And, and so listen, the scripture here says, don't just do the minimum that will get you by. That's biblical advice right here, right? Believers in Jesus, we should stand out at our jobs. If we're doing our best, guess what? In today's culture, man, you're going to shine. You're going to probably get noticed pretty quickly. You're going to probably get some promotions. You're going to stand out like God is going to open up some new doors for you. You're going to be like the MVP, y'all, the most valuable player, most valuable employee, right? Do your best. Why? Because here's ties right in with number two. Because number two, because you're working for God. You are working for God. We're reminded in this passage that you're not working for your boss you're not working for the company. You're not working for the man. You're working for your heavenly father, your creator, your maker, your designer. We're representing him in everything that we do, y'all. So, you know what? He's the one that got us that job. He got you that job. 
And I know some of y'all right now are pushing back in your mind. I know what some of y'all are thinking. You're like, what you talking about, Pastor T? I mean, I believe in God and everything, but I, I'm the one who got this job. I went to school. I got the, you know, all the requirements. I got the certification. I got the degree. I got the experience. I'm the one that did this. Okay. Okay. But who gave you the capacity to be able to go and study and get the experience and the strength to get up every single day? Wow, some other people, they, they, they're not even around anymore. God gave you that. He opened up the doors for you. He's provided for you, right? And so keep in mind, again, I quote from the scripture that we just read. It says, keep in mind that the ultimate master that you're serving is Christ. It's God. You're, you're working for him. So, so remember, y'all, do your best. You're working for God. Here's, here's the, the last point I want to bring out from this passage is you'll be held accountable. You'll be held accountable. The Message Bible translation says, the sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Sullen. We don't use that word much, right? Sullen. What, is that, what does that really mean? Here's what sullen means. The word sullen, it means a bad-tempered or gloomy person. You ever work with somebody like that? Oh, yeah. A lot of us have probably, right? Bad-tempered, gloomy person, negative all the time, right? You don't know what's going to trigger them to go off the handle, right? Listen, look at me real quick, y'all. Don't be that person. Don't be that person, especially as a follower of Jesus, right? The, the last line of that chapter, it says, it says, being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Now, sometimes in church circles, people get a pass on bad work because they're a Christian, or because they're doing it for God. Let me be real, y'all. I mean, sometimes there's people that will, will sing, and they can't even sing. They're off-key and crazy. But people are like, oh, God bless you. Oh, that was, oh yeah, that was amazing. Oh, oh, you know, like, they'll, they'll tell people that, right? There's some people that will cook a meal for some volunteers, and the food is terrible. It's bad. Later, everybody gets the runs from it. Real talk, I've been around situations in the church world where that has happened. Sister so-and-so made her special thing, and everybody just went home sick again, right? Like, oh, praise God, thank God for her, right? Or somebody will come and fix something at the church, and, and they'll rig the whole thing up. It's not even done right, and it's all, you got to go back and fix it 17 more times, and it's worse than it was before, right? And, and listen, if we're doing something and we're representing Jesus whether we're doing it for church or our work or, or whatever we're doing it for, we should give it our very best, y'all. We should do the best job. We shouldn't do shoddy work or even average work, but we should do the best work, y'all. And I know here at Crossover Church, we got some good workers. We got some hard workers. I know here we got some talented people, some people that are, are killing it. Listen, I want to tell you, I want to encourage you today, like, keep up the good work. Don't get tired. Don't tap out. Don't cut corners. Like, keep doing your very best. One of our core values here at Crossover is good is not good enough. We believe in excellence. And I think many times in the urban community, people can think like, ah, oh, well, we don't have as much resources, so ah, oh, we'll just make it work, right? We at Crossover have always believed, like, even though we might be in an urban context, we're going to do it in excellence. We're, we're going to do it just as good or better because we're doing it for Jesus, we're going to represent him, right? So in Abbott Elementary, um, there was a young teacher. You saw her in some of the clips. Her name is Janine Teagues, Miss, Miss, Miss Teagues, right? And she's always very optimistic in every situation a lot of times in the show. And she's always coming up with new ideas, and she's always trying to be encouraging, and, and she's trying to shift the atmosphere many times. And you know what? Many times she gets belittled. They make fun of her. They tell her, ah, what do you know? You've only been teaching for a year. You're only two years. I've been teaching for decades. That, you can't do that. that. That'll never work. But even in the midst of all that, and you might be in a work environment or situation where you get belittled, where people don't want to listen to your, your advice or they don't want to listen to your suggestions, right? And that might be hitting you today. But I just want to tell you, like, just stay faithful. Just stay optimistic. Just keep trying to shift that atmosphere, even if it seems like it's not working. Guess what? God sees. God sees your heart. God sees what you're doing. Stay consistent. Stay faithful. 
God's going to show up. God might open up another door for another job that's even better if the people aren't going to appreciate you where you're at. Who knows, right? I'll give you a little spoiler alert from season three. Miss Teague's actually, like, left the school because the district hired her to work for the school district to help make changes in underserved schools all over the city. And she regularly got to come back to Abbott to help, you know, that be kind of the pilot for it. And so she was elevated. Why? Because she was optimistic. She didn't give up. She had the right frames on. A couple years ago, I wrote a book called Frames. And my favorite chapter of Frames, anybody read Frames? Uh, My favorite chapter was the first chapter. And it was talking about pessimistic frames versus optimistic frames. And to be optimistic, right? And the biblical story talked about Caleb and Joshua, and there was 10 other scouts. There was 12 of them in total, and they had been rescued from Egypt, came across the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness. God's providing for them, and God told Moses, send 12 scouts into the promised land to go check it out and come back with a report. So they came back with a report, and 10 of them had a negative report. Like, oh, man, there's giants in the land. The cities are big. Like, they're going to devour us. It's crazy. We can never win. Right, but two of them, somebody say two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they came back with the right frames on, optimistic frames. And like, hold up, God just rescued us from Pharaoh. Well, y'all, y'all, y'all were all there when we walked through the Red Sea, saw the walls of water around us. God provided water and food for us, even in the middle of the desert, the wilderness. Like, if God is telling us this is the land He promised for us, let's go. God can certainly help us, right? But here's the sad part, y'all, if you know the story. They listened to the 10 instead of the 2. It's always easy to listen to the voices when they're louder. And as humans, many times we're drawn to the negative more than to the positive, to the pessimistic more than the optimistic, right? And if you know the story in Scripture, it caused over a million people to miss their promised land. Because God said, okay, that's how you're going to roll. Everybody over 20 is not going to live to make it into the promised land. You're going to die here in the wilderness. But there was only two exceptions to that rule that walked across that line into the promised land. And by that time, scholars say they were in their 80s, and that was Joshua and Caleb. They saw the promised land because they had the right frames on. They were optimistic. So I want to encourage you today, you might be in some toxic situations at your job, some challenging things with your family or whatever, have the right frames on because you can do this you could choose to sink and settle when it gets hard like a lot of people did during the pandemic the last couple years they just they just sunk and settled or you can rise and lead let me tell you something God is calling his people to rise and lead to rise and lead y'all most people sunk and settled during the pandemic they did But there's a smaller group of people. They didn't just survive, they thrived. Some of them reinvented themselves, they went back to school, they started businesses, they started, uh, they they solved big problems and they thrived during that time. Why? Because they chose to rise and lead above the bad reports, above the bad news. And there's a lot of bad news going on right now in the world. A lot of scary news that's happening. But you know what? As believers, we can rise and lead. Because we know God's got us even in the middle of the storm. Amen? So I want you to bow your heads. I want to pray for you today. If you're worshiping online, if you could join us and pray. And I know today's message was a little bit different. Talking about work and tying that in with a, a comedy, right? But I believe that God wanted to speak to many of you today that are at a job in a work environment that might not be the greatest. But today, God's tapping you on the shoulder and he's saying, rise and lead. Do your best. Be optimistic. Stand out. You're working for me. You're representing me. If you're here today and you would be like, Pastor Tommy, I need prayer at my job. I want to do my best. I know I could, I could, I could do even better. If you need some prayer for your job and the situation you're at, I want you to raise your hand today. I want to pray for you. If you're worshiping online at home, just type in the chat, pray for me. Keep your hands up. Let me lift you up today. Father, I lift up my family right now. You know the story behind each and every hand that's lifted, every heart that's lifted right now. God, I I pray for them. 
in the work situation that they're in right now or maybe a relationship situation that they're in right now. God, I just pray you're going to touch them, guide them, direct them. God, help them to let their light shine. Give them the discernment of what to do in certain situations that your Holy Spirit will give them the words to say. Give them direction on what to do, what not to do in each and every moment. And God, use them to shine and represent you. I pray they'll do their best. I pray they'll excel. Those that own a company or an entrepreneur, I pray they'll excel because they're doing their best. They're working for you. They're representing you. God, may we be a light everywhere that we go and that we'll stand out because of the way that we operate, the way that we function, because we're following the principles and the guidance that's in your word. God, bless my family today. Bless them this summer. This is going to be an amazing summer. You're going to open up new doors. There's going to be breakthroughs. As we rebuild some things, there's going to be miracles. I pray blessings on them today. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Family, God bless you guys.